so glad even more so that he knows me. Amen. I don't want to see Jesus as he says depart from me. I never knew you. Amen. I want him to recognize the spirit of God that he has placed in my life. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 through 30. And uh, the last time I was here, before my trip to California, I preached from the subject that I, the dynamics of a missed opportunity. And uh, in that message, we talked about the people of God who were poised to go into the promised land, but because of their fears and their insecurity, because they saw that opportunity as opposition, and because they really didn't see the opportunity through the eyes of Christ, they saw the opportunity through, the, through their own eyes. In other words, they looked at their own flaws, their own weaknesses, their own capabilities, and they decided they were not enough to do what God had called them to do. And I dare say there's somebody sitting here right now because of who you are, because you keep it real, because you keep it 100, you say to yourself, I'm not fit, I'm not qualified, I'm not the one to do what God has called me to do. And there you are, you're about to miss your once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And so we said to you, if you're going to take advantage of the opportunities that God presents to you, you've got to mix that opportunity with faith. Not faith in your ability, but faith in God's ability to get the best and the, and the most out of your life. Amen. And then we said that you have to see this opportunity 
in lieu of God's word. What has God promised to those who keep his word and who do his will? And then finally we say that if you're going to get it done, you're going to trust, have to trust God. Know that God is with you every step of the way. And so this morning in Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30, we are going to continue this same sermon subject, the dynamic of a missed opportunity, part two. And we're saying to you, don't bury your talent, use it. Say that to somebody. Don't bury your talent, but use it. Amen. Let's hear what the scripture says here in Matthew 25. Then we're going to pray and uh, our ushers are going to be able to sit and enjoy this message along with you. Amen. Matthew 25, beginning at verse number 14, I believe it is. Yes. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered my seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. Hmm, that's, 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 that's rough. For whoever has will be given more. They will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I believe I'll pray right here. That's tough medicine to swallow this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is anointed. It shall not return to your void. It shall accomplish everything that you send it out to do. Father, we thank you this morning that each person seated here has been given talents. And each person seated here needs to know your will as it pertains to the talents you have given them. Father, give them ears to hear 
what the Spirit is saying to them in this message. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said amen. amen. And amen. Let's just thank you for your service this morning. You may be seated. Uh, this text contains a parable of warning and promise. It is a reminder that the use of our talents demonstrates our faithfulness to God. The Father distributes gifts and opportunities for service to his followers as the basis for us to use and improve throughout our lives. When the discussion in a small group turned to evangelism, one person gave a big sigh of relief and stated, well, that's just not my gift. With that statement, he buried his God-given talent to share Christ's love with his world. How many of us have buried the gifts God offers us in search of that special gift? In other words, how many of us who are born-again believers do not share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ because we don't think we measure up to how others are gifted in the kingdom? How many of us do not share the talent of being a witness of Jesus Christ and have buried that gift in the sand. How many of us have lived with Jesus Christ and have won no one to the kingdom of God? Remember, evangelism is not a strategy of church growth. It is a strategy of kingdom growth. And when you when a soul to Jesus Christ, you are adding children to the family of God. As you add children to the family of God, then as they become disciples, disciples grow churches. And because you know the difference, you are not afraid then to witness about Jesus Christ. This is one of the dynamics of a missed opportunity because we don't think we're smart enough. We don't think we're righteous enough. We don't think we have the wherewithal as it pertains to knowing the word of God to witness to anyone. But the owner, the author of our faith, gives us the assurance that if we tell somebody what the Lord has done in our lives, we will win somebody to Jesus. And that's what this parable is talking about. It is talking about how we invest what God has given us in the lives of other people. It talks about money because that's how people understand things. People can understand investing money in a savings account or in an investment account or in real estate and those sorts of things. They understand getting a return on your investment. But what Jesus is talking about is not money. What Jesus is talking about is are the believers in him telling somebody else about him. And he admonishes us in this text, don't bury your talent. Don't be a child of God and never say anything to anybody about how far the Lord has brought you. Lord have mercy. Some of us think we've got to have some extraordinary testimony in order to share that we are believers in Jesus Christ. He must have gotten us out of drugs or he might have uh, delivered us from uh, domestic abuse. He may have delivered us from some sexual abuse or some, you know, some great testimony that is so off the wall 
until, you know, that just lets us know how great God is. But if you were uh, preserved from domestic violence, yes. if you were kept from sexual abuse, if you've never been an addict, you've got a testimony yes. that God kept you yes. when others were falling. Yes. And the fact that God kept you from all of these things that other people were falling victim to is enough for you to shout and tell somebody, if it had not been the Lord on my side, it could have been me. Mm, I better slow down here. But each of us have been gifted. So then, what is evangelism and what is the message of evangelism? I'm glad you asked. We had the clinic this weekend at our conference. I'm going to share this five uh, hand with you. I'm going to just tell you, hold up your hand. There you go. Hold up your hand. You see that? That's five fingers. And what this hand says is that you are a human being and that everything you are comes from God. So when you take this hand and you want to explain to people about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done from you, for you, you understand that it's not really about you, but it's about Jesus. You take that thumb. Everybody say thumbs up. Thumbs up says that that's God. That God's throne is in heaven and he invites everyone to come and live with him in glory. We call heaven glory. God invites every person that he has created to be a part of his family and to come and live with him. Anybody here want to live with him forever? He promises eternal life. He promises you a life of, of, of peace and joy and happiness, and when you compare the life that he uh, invites you to have with the life that you're living now, you ought to want a piece of that. And you ought to be able to tell people, the life that I have in God is much better than the life I'm living right now. But there's a problem. You ought to tell them there's a problem. The only thing that is keeping us from living with God in eternal life is the fact that we are a human being, and with a human being comes sin. That's that other finger. Go on, shoot them. All have sinned, Romans 3, 23, and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. How do you know? Because three of them fingers should be pointing back at you. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But because all had sinned, no one was worthy to give atonement for sin, and therefore there came a man named Jesus. Add that other finger to it. Jesus was born into the world to save us from our sin. That was his sole mission to reconcile us back to God. And when we understand that it took Jesus, a sinless God man, to bear our sins on the cross, that that is the only way to be saved. He is the only one that God accepts as a propitiation or the atonement for sin. You ought to want to know who he is. You ought to want to get on board. You ought to want to accept and receive his salvation. And so then when you realize that God is and that we are sinners and that Jesus came, then you also know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Did you get that? He didn't wait till you cleaned up what you messed up. He died before he died so that you would have a right to be born again wherever and whatever generation you're born into. And for over 2,000 years, Jesus' sin atonement on the cross has been effective in the lives of people all over the world. While you were yet sinners, 
Did you get that? While you was yet sinners, Christ died for you. In other words, he put it on credit because he believed that when you share and when others hear what God did for them through Jesus Christ, they're going to want to know more about it. Did you get that? They, they, they are going to want to know more and more about it. And so, therefore, you're going to tell them. You're going to tell them with these four fingers. You're going to tell them the good news. And the good news is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Somebody say everlasting life. Everlasting. What kind of life is Jesus talking about? Jesus says, I came that you may have life and that more abundantly. Jesus says, I'm coming to give you the God kind of life. Now, does anybody know who can threaten God and get away with it? The God kind of life is that life free from transgression. Free from turmoil, free from struggle, free from headache, free from cancer, free from all the things that, that, that assault us in this life. The abundant life is eternal. It is filled with joy. It is filled with holiness. It is filled with righteousness. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it is filled with peace. That's what people need to know. They need to know that there is more than just what they're experiencing right now. They need to know that when they accept Jesus Christ, they are being grafted into the family of God. That they're being grafted into the family of a God who is love and who loves and who forgives and who nurtures and who says that if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Then you go back to your little finger and you ask yourself, well, how can I inherit this life? How can I become a part of God's family? And then you have to tell them about saving faith. Saving faith is not just mental assent. Saving faith is not just when you get healed. Saving faith is not when you do good deeds in the world. In other words, it's not of works. Because we don't want anybody boasting about what they did for God. On, you boast about what God did for you. See, salvation is a free gift. And if I give you a gift, I don't want you reaching in your pocket trying to pay me for the gift. Well, if you receive Jesus Christ, you have to receive it as a free gift. You have to receive it as a free gift. And some of us find that difficult because we beat up on ourselves so bad about the things we've done in the world. And we just can't believe that someone would love us enough to look beyond our faults and see our need. We just can't, we don't think we're worth it. We don't think anyone would think enough of us mm, to do something for us and then not try to con us or abuse us after. Let me see if I can illustrate that. There was a mission family that went overseas and uh, while they were over there, they were trying to help this small community build a community. So they instituted some rules that came from the Ten Commandments about you can't steal and cheat and lie and all of these things. And so the head missionary and his family, even his mother came and they were in the village and things were going well. But then one of the villagers came to the missionary chief and said to, to the chief, somebody has been stealing. And the law says whoever's been stealing is going to be whipped. And so he told them to go find out who it is stealing 
so we can enforce the law. So the search was made. You know how people be watching for you to do wrong. And so somebody saw this person doing wrong, and they came back to the chief, and they said, we found the person that's been stealing. And the chief said, go find that scoundrel. We're going to punish him today. They're going to get whipped today because we can't have nobody stealing among us. So they went out and got the person. The person was the chief's mother. So here you have the chief who loves his mother, but the chief who also has to do justice. And that's God. God loves us, but God is also just. This is what the chief did because the chief knew God. The chief stood the mother before the whole village, told the mother she was wrong, told the mother the punishment, told the villagers to tie her up to the pole and go get the whip. When they went and got the whip, the chief took off his coat, took off his shirt, Said, don't beat her, beat me. I'll take her punishment. And they beat the chief. They were trying to figure out why would the chief take the punishment for his mother. It was because of the love that the chief had. And that's why when you ask yourself, why would God send his only begotten son to give his life a ransom for your sins. Why would Jesus take the beating for you? Why would Jesus hang on the cross for you? Because God is a God of love. But God is also a God of justice. And what God did was God allowed Jesus to take your punishment. God allowed Jesus to willingly say to God, prepare me a body and I'll come down and I'll take the punishment for humanity. When the time came to pay the debt for sin, Jesus was stripped. He was beaten with a cat of nine tails one strike before death. His body bruised, crown of thorns on his head, led through the streets as a common criminal. And every sin that could be known and spoken was put upon his shoulder. Every secret sin, every obvious sin, every sin of omission, every sin of commission, every sin of disposition, every sin of condition was placed upon his shoulders. And by his stripes, you and I were healed. But it didn't stop there. Because capital punishment in that day was to be hung on a cross publicly humiliated. So he allowed himself to be marched up Golgotha's hill, stretched out and nailed to the cross. He had you in mind. He had me in mind because he knew one day we would be born and we would need a savior to save us from our sin. None of us has to be trained on how to be bad because we're born in sin, shapen in iniquity. But Jesus, knowing that, said, I'm going to give my life even for your iniquity, which is that inborn sin that you came here with. I'm going to allow myself to be hung on a cross for those transgressions, which are the sin that you do because you're big and bad enough to do them. They stretched him wide. They hung him high. 
when you tell people, tell them what good things the Lord has done for them. Tell them that there is a better way, that there is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And when they ask you, how can I be born again? How can I become a member in the family of God? Tell them that the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. How do I call on his name? You tell him you've got to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that if they can believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus really did what the Bible says he did, that he did die and he did rise again on the third day. If they can believe it and confess it, then they shall be Say that you don't work your way into salvation, you faith your way into salvation. You don't get yourself right to be saved. You allow God to change your thinking. You allow God to change your heart. You allow God to change your mind. And as you do this, you begin to understand that your testimony is not about you. That you're not there to tell folks how good you are, which prevents some of us from sharing the good news. You're there to tell people how good Jesus is and how good God is and that you're a disciple, that you are a disciplined learner. No, you're not all you expect to be. You're not all you want to be, but you're on the way. That you're a disciple. You're learning more about Jesus. You're living more like Jesus. And there is no shame in your testimony because you fall short. All of us fall short. I'm not asking you to believe in me and my life. I'm asking you to believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you to judge my religion. All of us struggle with something. But I'm asking you to believe in the one who has conquered death, hell, and the grave. I'm asking you to believe in the one who has eternal life, the author and finisher of our faith. Beloved, don't bury your talent. God gave it to you. Jesus says that you shall be witnesses of me. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And the Holy Spirit is going to give you the words to say, to testify about me. The Holy Spirit will bring back things to your remembrance for you to be able to tell somebody about the Lord. And each of us are challenged to go out into the world Invest this good news. Bring back a harvest of souls so that when Jesus returns, and he is returning, you'll hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. You, you helped enlarge the kingdom by telling somebody about Jesus. This morning, don't miss an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. You can do it on one hand. You can do it on one hand. You can just be sitting there while you're talking, just moving your fingers and help you remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I declare if you tell somebody about Jesus this week, somebody's going to receive him. You're going to pray the prayer of faith with them. Well, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. Well, let me tell you how to pray. You take them by the hand and you ask them, do you believe that you're a sinner in need of a Savior? Are you aware that you were born with a tendency to do wrong and not do right? Don't you agree that your mother and father had to teach you what was right from wrong? Haven't you done something 
wrong in your life that you know about? And they're going to say yes. And you're going to say, well, that's why Jesus came. He bore that sin on the cross because he loves you. And he didn't want you to be not be denied salvation because of your sin. And then you're going to ask him, wouldn't you like to meet the man who gave his life for you? They're going to say, yes, I would. And you're going to tell them, well, all you have to do is confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. Repeat after me. Y'all help me with this this morning. Y'all repeat after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, bow you I bow before you in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. who died for my sins. I ask for your forgiveness and your love. I receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Here I am, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, and I'll live for you. I'll learn of you in every day, in every way. I'll be, I'll be better in Jesus name. in Jesus name and then you bring them to church and introduce them to the pastor the clergy staff say this person was one to Christ I witnessed to them and they accepted Jesus pastor they're ready to be discipled and then when we do the invitation to discipleship they know it's their time to come they know that that's that moment when they're fitting to say publicly to the world, I'm a believer in Jesus. And then we bring them before God, thanking God for their salvation, asking God to use them in the kingdom, and we put them in discipleship classes. And as they grow, the church grows because they go out with you now, and both of you are testifying about the goodness of God found in the face of Jesus Christ. The church has the greatest message in the world. We've got the solution for everything that ails society. We've got the greatest story ever told, and we need to tell it. Don't let your insecurities and your fears Rob you of an opportunity to testify about Jesus. Would you stand this morning? Would you stand this morning? Now hold your hand up. Just hold your hand up. Amen. And now hold your thumb up and say, thumbs up. Thumbs up. I'm looking up, I'm looking up. To, heaven. to heaven. Then take that next finger like you're shooting your gun, and say, sin, sin tried, to me tried to keep me from heaven. From heaven. Then hold that third finger up. But God the Father, God the Father made, a made a way of escape. Of escape. Hold that fourth finger up. You have to work it like me. I got a little arthritis, you know. Hold that fourth finger up best you can and say, the solution was Jesus. Jesus gave, his life Jesus gave his life for my sin. For my sin. And then hold that, hold that pinky finger up. Now you're back to five. And say, I received Jesus, I received Jesus. By, faith. by faith. And because of that faith, of that, faith that, God that God gave me, I am, I am redeemed, redeemed. Reconciled. reconciled. I'm a child, I'm a child of, the of the kingdom. Through Jesus Christ. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. 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 While you're standing, if you have not, uh, well, we just went through that, but if you have not really given your life to Jesus through discipleship, you've not said, Pastor, I need a, a mentor. I need someone to teach me the way of Christ. 
you need to fellowship with someone who knows him, we want you to come this morning. We want to make sure that you have a mentor, a good mentor. And then we want to make sure that you've got a good church home where you can learn of Jesus and grow and go out on the mission field and see God use your testimony. Look at your neighbor and say, God wants to use my testimony. My testimony is good enough to win somebody to Jesus Christ. Give the Lord a hand and clap of praise. Hallelujah. 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 This morning, this is the invitation to discipleship. We bid you come. You don't have a church home. You don't have anyone to show you the way of Christ. We bid you to come this morning that we might get you started in this new life of faith. You believe you received Jesus this morning. We want you to come at this time. Our hymn of invitation this morning is, Oh, I want to see him. What appropriate, number 41. Oh, I want to see him. Yes. And if you're here this morning, we bid you come. Safely keep and he leaves. 
seated. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's worthy. He's 